Yeah, no worries. How you doing today, Lars? Yeah, I'm good, thank you, man. I'm good, thank you. Yeah. Good, good, good. good. Um, before we steam straight into your track list, I just want to uh, touch upon a, a, a bananish year that it's really strange. I, I found myself more recently saying things like, yeah, no, no, I saw them live last year. No, not last year, the year before, because like <laughs> last year just don't seem to exist. You know what I mean? So I just yeah. want to ask you, um, you know, who's, who's, I guess, the fundamentals of, of what they do is, is, you know, is getting out there and touring and playing and how you found the last year as you, Loz, human being, and yeah. uh, and as a, as a creative, as a musician? Um, initially, I'll, I'll sort of tackle how it's been for me personally. It's been, at times, it's been good. Other times, it's been horrendous. Um, that being because I think that the strain that the unknowingness of the pandemic has brought some of us people and how um, heavily isolated people are has completely changed, has, for some people, completely changed everything. And that's been very, very tough. Um, earlier in the lot, like the, uh, after the, sort of towards the end of the first lockdown, I actually lost a very close friend to suicide. Um, and, you know, you can't, you can't 100% attribute that to it just being about the pandemic, you know, but I definitely feel like, for some people, not having their social, you know, outlets is is really takes its toll when you're isolated in that way. So that was really tough. Um, but also at the same time, you know, it, yeah, it, it was it was just tough, and it was tough for a lot of people. But you know, we we all had to come together and support each other in that way. And and you know, it, I think for many people, it will it will you know, have the same sort of connotation surrounding it. Like for some people, it's been ridiculously hard, but then for other people, you've seen like a unity grow between certain situations that, you know, you otherwise might not have. Um, so, so that was really tough for me. And I feel like, you know, it, it's really tough on a lot of people. And I think the best thing you can do is talk to people and let you know, let people know you're there for them, you know? Sorry to kickstart this on, on a really... No, sorry. man, like, you know, this is what this chat's about. You know, I ask these questions, you know, because, I, you know, and, and I respect the fact that you give honest answers. Do you know what yeah, I mean? It's yeah. like, so, the, the, you know, it's, it's been difficult times. It's, you know, nobody can ever dispute that. And and like you say, like, some people are going to really struggle if they've not got that distraction of of other people and being around other people and, and that, that kind of thing that maybe takes them away from their own thoughts for a while that that escapism you know yeah definitely and I feel I feel like a lot of people especially in my hometown Doncaster like I've witnessed a lot of people sort of that were very sociable people that were going out to the pub like quite frequently and stuff like that they're now sort of like behind closed doors and like I've witnessed a few people online like taking a lot of drugs at home or like drinking heavily at home you know and then you know obviously I've been in Doncaster pretty much all my life so I'm very much in the thick of it here and I know I do know a lot of people from growing up here and playing playing music here since I was younger so you know you might you could say that I like just because I know so many people I'm seeing so many of these different um different sort of situations but but yeah it, it's definitely been difficult on people I mean switching switching that up a bit and talking about the band situation and the pandemic I think for us um we've been very lucky with how things have fallen into place. We did a lot of touring before the pandemic got to the point where it was getting really serious. And we had to cut a few dates off our American tour because we were like, what if, if everything shuts down, we're not going to be at home. We're going to be in America. So that was the initial thought when everything hit for us. And so from then, um, we got back home and then that's when everything sort of really picked up and they were shutting down stuff and and that but we like I say we did a lot of touring pre lockdown so and 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 working out the severity of the situation so we'd already had it in our plans to come back and then start um start demoing tracks and writing songs and then after that moving into the studio so what was going to happen for while she sleeps was we would go come back have a couple of months writing and then over festival season be writing and recording and dipping out to play festivals. So in a strange way, like it's, it gave it, it gave us a bit of time to just focus on the record as opposed to usually we'd be sort of touring and then uh, sort of in the studio and writing and then dip out for a weekend. And your plan is always to carry on that, that positive train of like writing oh, music yeah. whilst you're on the road, but it never really works like that because 
there's so many things going on when you're touring anyway. So it's, it, it, you know, pros and cons for, for it all. But, um, you know, the actual recording process was quite tricky because we're trying to always keep our distance and we can only have like two people in the studio at one time and, and different things like that. But then, but then, you know, we do have a, a warehouse in Sheffield um, which is it's got quite a big, we've got a studio there and a live room and quite a big outdoor space, if you like. So we, we were able to be safe and distant and disinfect everything and wear masks, but still kind of be in the same vicinity whilst writing. So that did really help. Um, so yeah, a bit of a roller coaster for us in this whole process. But I think like we're really positive about our new record and we're really stoked on it. And, and I think that there is... There's the usual stuff in there for while she sleeps where we talk about similar things and but there's also this like yearning for that sort of um unity that we get from a live show as well and i feel like yeah. you can really sort of hear that in the songs uh, and hear that come through and um there's a de there's a, uh, a song on the record that actually isn't sort of um it's not a covid song by any means but i think that the you know the the elements that that song holds i think for people you know that have gone through this time or or when it comes out are probably still going to be in this time it'll be a very very strong song and i think um hopefully the song nervous uh featuring simon neal from biffy clyro on the record nice i feel like it it really encompasses how we felt in the past and how people just probably feel without the pandemic but i think it really really sort of it really um yeah, I think it's going to be a really important song for people and hopefully they they hear and feel that in the same way we do towards it. But yeah, it's uh, I think um, for a lot of people, I feel like people are uh, really holding on to when when are things going to be back to normal? And I think the important thing to focus on through such a strange time is the little victories, um, not thinking too far ahead. So you're constantly waiting for stuff to Absolutely. get back to normal, but, but focusing a little bit smaller than that and thinking, you know, we've, we've kind of got this far and, you know, try and, try and focus on the small positives rather than the, the overall outlook. I think that's quite important. I, th I think that's quite healthy as well, man. I, I, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Right, Lars, let's talk records. No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was tough to pick, you know. But... It's good, good. It's meant to be tough, man. Yeah, yeah. So right. I, don't know, I don't know how my choices were like. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like look in terms of like anyone else you've had on the show hopefully you know hopefully it's it's what you're looking for but it's it's really difficult I feel like when you're digging back in your memory and being like so what was that song for me um but hopefully this kind of makes a fun playlist anyway so wicked all right track one yes yeah. what's the song with a greatest ever intro please um this was ridiculously difficult, I think. Cause this is the one that everyone like, struggles with. You rack in your brain for like awesome songs and like there's so many bands out there and, and records. But um, I went for Refuse New Noise mm. um, because I think the anticipation of when that finally kicks in after the initial riff is ticking over for so long and it's building yeah. and it's building and like, yeah, when it, when it comes in, it slaps. And that, that was such an important record for me in terms of like, uh, sort of figuring out what I liked in terms of music and before that I'd never really like heard of Refused so when I heard that track and the video for it as well really helps the, to visualize what the, what the what the emotion and the feeling is of that that intro and that song and it like when I saw it and heard it for the first time it literally blew my mind I was like this, this I want to be in this band you know yeah. it was exactly it was exactly the vibe that I was uh, wanting from a from a song Aside from this one, no one's chose anything that you've chose today, right? Oh, but cool. only last week I had Papa Roach on and they chose this for their intro as well. So you're in good company, man. No way, was that Jacoby? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and, nice. Uh, yeah, he's, he's a good dude, man. I, I, loved, I love him. So, yeah, that's, that's interesting. But, yeah, cool. Uh, and I was like, and as soon as like, I, I heard it again, I was like, because I had not heard it for a long time. And I was like, yeah. man, that is an intro. It's, yeah. And when I got your list, I was like, oh, he's gone for it as well. Wicked. Like, it's, <laughs> it's just a, it's a solid channel. I mean, we do put a little Spotify playlist to accompany all the pods so, so people can nice. go and listen to it. And, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah man, it's, it's, it's a great intro. And, I mean, I guess for the, you know, and take this with the greatest respect, for the, the sort of the nature of the, the music that you make, yeah. I, I always like to ask musicians how they approach intros and if they're conscious of the way that, 
the way that people listen to music is changing very quickly so far as like attention spans and 100 percent, yeah and i know you know and trying to get radio play but i guess I suppose, unless you're looking at a Dan Picard show, I guess mainstream radio is that a consideration when you write as, a, as an, you know, as an alternative sort of rock band? Is it, you know, is it always in the back of your mind we want to get playlisted? Yeah, I mean, I think strangely, you know, like even if you're like an underground punk band or anything like that, I feel like almost like it, it sort of lends itself to that recognition you know if someone picks a track up whether you intended it to be for that reason or not if someone yeah. picks it up and they like it and they're willing to play it um it you know it's a great feeling so i think for while she sleeps it's not really like we're not really like right let's write a, a, a song that's a ballad to push for radio and then let's write a song to we just sort of write songs and then if something like that does sort of rear its head if you like we're kind of yeah. like well this actually would really work for for maybe maybe pushing towards radio or, or a bit more of a daytime as opposed to like you say like the rock show yeah and um, i think that there's some, something that happens accidentally but once you sort of get the track listings together and you sort of start listening to demos back to back you kind of go actually that one would really work well on like a more you know people driving home from work kind of thing or whatever so you know i think you know it, it's always nice when that sort of thing happens um in in a sort of happy accident way but for, for sleeps we're not like Right, let's write a song that that like the daytime radio one is, is going to pick up. So yeah, it's a bit more of an organic thing for us. And if we happen to write something that, that would go to radio, then then it's a bonus, I guess. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. What was the first song you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you, please? Uh, well, when I was younger, um, my, like my parents were playing a lot of uh, a lot of different styles of music really around the house like my dad my dad had a study where i wasn't allowed to go in where i'm pretty sure he was like blazing weed and playing, <laughs> and playing chess you know what i mean and he had like a drum kit in there and his guitars and and the door was always shut and like a bit of a smog was coming from under the door you know um, and, I, and i've got a bit like weird memories of that as a kid but my middle name is floyd my dad was a big uh, a huge pink floyd fan um but i also like remember as a real youngster being into a lot, a, lot, a lot of Michael Jackson stuff and just, I had like a studded glove and a bad t-shirt and a mullet, do you know what I mean? And it was just, I guess when you're that age, it's just whatever you hear that you kind of, what, what your parents are playing. So Absolutely. my mum really liked sort of um, bands like Marillion and like Levelers, which is like, I never really heard much like that. And, and um, for anyone that doesn't know, the Levelers are like, uh, like an, I think they're Irish, they're an, like an Irish folk band. They're, they're, they're from Brighton. Band. They're from Brighton. Oh God, I put my foot in that. <laughs> Not like a right foot. Um, but it's got that Irish folky feel to it. 100%. Yeah, I think it's like the violins that run yeah. through it, and it, it, it definitely feels like that. But they, my mum's name's Julie, and they always had a song. They have a song called Julie. It's actually a really beautiful song about a lovely woman, record. Uh, where they're from. So that for me was was real big connection with like a song and obviously it's, it's your mother's name and like it, it's always reminding me of it and even today when like you know my mum lived in Sweden for a little while and, and even you'd think with touring life I'd be able to get out there quite a bit and see her but she lived really out in the sometimes I'd have Julie on my playlist and it even like just give me a, a you know it, it's sometimes hard with family you kind of sometimes drop the ball and forget to forget to sort of write home and make phone calls and stay in contact as much as you can especially when you're out everyone's got different so it's just your, your mic your mic's kicking in and out a little bit Loz. Right. is it just, is it all right now yeah it was just crackling a few, few times when you were chatting right. then sorry about that that's all um, right dude yeah go on carry on with julie yeah, and, and basically, so just reminding me to call home and, and just give my parents a bit of FaceTime, you know, and yeah. so when I hear it just randomly come up on my playlist, as much as just loving the song, I think it's a great song, like it just gives me that kick to make sure I'm calling home and reminds me of uh, being young and being in the car with my mum, it's, it's, it's cool. And it's like, for, you know, the, for, for the Levelers, that was, I think that was probably one of their, their biggest hits as well. Um, <laughs> it, it was a single and it was, I think it was maybe from like album three or four, um and it is a beautiful record it's it's, it's heart-wrenching it's like it's, yeah. a, it's a pretty tragic story isn't it yeah it um, is yeah but the thing is for me like my, like i don't want to get all like emo about the whole thing my mum and dad went through a pretty brutal separation when i was a kid yeah and um my dad actually moved out and went next door but one you know 
Wow. So it was, and my mum had four kids all under the age of nine and she was like really striving to like, you know, look after us. And she was trying, she did it. She's basically my superhero because having four kids under the age of um, nine, I was the oldest. And then she, she would go to college in the day. She would come back and she would have a job in a music store um, uh, on a weekend. And then like she went out like, to, like literally doing anything she could to raise the cash to support us all. So like, like you say, that song's like quite a sad, emotional song. But I think some of the some of the things within that kind of reminded me of that and reminded me how when I look back on it now, how much like my mum was prepared to do and how hard she worked to like make sure we like didn't go without and all these other things. So like like you say, that's interesting for me to 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 look through and not not that everything's exactly the same, but it sort of it holds on to a bit of that feeling, like the Julie by the Levelers has a bit of that feeling. It reminds me of that time, yeah. All oh, right, that's, that's I, I don't think anyone's uh, kind of explained the reasons behind that song quite as as good as that. <laughs> right. that's uh that's wonderful man um have you heard frank turner do that i haven't heard frank turner do that no no Ooh, that's a bit special yeah i'll yeah. check that out definitely maybe right. if you do the playlist in put the levelers one in then and put that maybe put that in as an alternative yeah. good shot good shot yeah he he done levelers done like a kind of thing where they got lots of their kind of favorite artists to to cover some of their songs they had billy bragg on there and a couple of else nice. but, but frank does julie and Oh my god, he, he barks it as well. It's really good, man. It's really yeah, good. That sounds great, yeah. Right, well, let's stay in those formative years, Lars. And for track three, the song that reminds you of your time at school, please, mate. Yeah, the, the song I'll choose for this is um, Slipknot, Spit It Out. Cool. Um, I think that record came out in 1999, which would have meant at the time I was about, uh, you leave school at 16. I was like 14, 15, probably. Um, I mean, that's prime, isn't it? That's the prime age to get something like that, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And um, it, this was like, there was a few kids at my school that were like heavily into like Nirvana and stuff. And that's sort of, that was like my first glimpse into this like alternative lifestyle being like, what are these, like the kids at my school were like growing their hair out and stopped washing their hair and stuff, you know, like proper grunge Nirvana style. I remember thinking these these lads are cool. Do you know what I mean? Like they they got rape and they were like a bit, there was like four or five of them that were just like didn't give a fuck. Do you know what I mean? And it like dragged me in with it, and then so quite quickly like started just like listening to whatever I could get my hands on in terms of like alternative heavy stuff. And and that that was like bands like Marilyn Manson, Limp Bizkit, Slipknot, Linkin Park, and quite quickly just opened the door and, and got rolling. But it was Slipknot, Slipknot. I got hold of and. I was just like, wow. And obviously that, that album's got weight and bleed on it. And like that was like such a huge track for them back then. But Spit It Out's in intro is like, it's like infectious. You know, it's like, it repeats on you and it's like, this sounds so gnarly. And I just remember being like, literally being that kid on the back of the school bus that like, probably took a slap off a chav, you know what I mean? For like having like a dirty Marilyn Manson hoodie on and just like being like, I'm into this shit. Like it, that, all those bands at that time really spoke to me. And like, I loved that it was like, it was different to everybody else. And like, just hearing, just hearing how heavy that was at that time, just, and literally being in that situation of like, Chavs were hating on me for wearing like a Slipknot hoodie. And, and uh, yeah, it just, just that really hits me. Like the back of the school bus, like, like hood, hood up, like headphones in on the, on the CD player, you know what I mean? <laughs> on the, on the Discman or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, that would be my, that would be my choice for that. It's, it's, I mean, to, to have experienced that at that age, like that, that kind of, whatever you want to call it, new metal or whatever you want to kind of call it that was happening then, at 14 years of age, I mean, to see pop stars that look like Marilyn Manson, <laughs> like it's, it, you know, I, I remember like around about that time, I was, I was like doing a band, we went to see this record label that were interested in signing us. And we was just a pretty much straight up kind of guitar rock band. Uh, yeah. I remember when they called us in and they were like right okay look I said like you know what, what's happening and they said that to be honest like you know it's alright but like if you was a young lad that liked guitar music I don't think they're going to like what you are because we was just like five <laughs> scruffy herberts with like with long hair and that yeah. and then he just held up a copy of uh, it was Karangal Metal Hammer and it had yeah. Manson on the cover 
And he was like, oh, do you think they're going to want this? And I was like, yeah, they're definitely going to want that. Like, because yeah. it just looked scary, it looked weird. I mean, I, I don't know if we should even be talking about Marilyn Manson. He's in all sorts of trouble right now, isn't he? Oh, yeah, I've kind of not not read up about anything, but I've heard on the grapevine something's in Yeah, like, likewise. So, um, but, but but more importantly, if that weren't weird enough to a young... Because these, these pop stars looked like cartoon characters, you know? It was so relatable and it was so larger than life and so different. And then fucking Slipknot come along and it's like... Yeah. Holy shit, they've just took this to a different level now. They like, like, all look of... fucking terrifying. It's like... <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. And that's the thing, like, the message that those bands were giving out as well was, like, nothing I'd ever heard before. And it was just, like, like, and it just... The whole, the whole scene at that time just blew my mind and really sort of paved the way for, for me being interested in this whole thing. I think for a lot of people, like, especially coming through different phases of, of different sort of genres getting big, like emo and, and like punk rock and, and all this stuff growing up. Like it just, a lot of people have kind of like, they got into it as, as youngsters and then you can kind of, you, you know, people that you've seen since like in the supermarket or something and they've just completely like, it's left them behind. And, and, and I know that being around the music industry now is obviously what keeps me so connected to it and, and it's what I do now, but I still even think that if I wasn't in, in While She Sleeps, like I'd still definitely be interested in that thing. Like it's never really left me. And I think importantly, um, the whole like, the whole community side of, of rock and metal is is so important, you know? And and, and that, so, that side of things has never left me. Like even, you know, going out flyering for your first gigs and stuff like that, there's no better feeling than having like a few people turn up you know, most people just throw your flyers on the floor, but you kind of, like, there were no internet to be promoting on. So I remember going out and flyering for shows and, like, actually seeing people maybe turn up that, that got one of your flyers in the town on a Saturday, like, the following Wednesday night or something. It's, it was such a such a cool, like, environment to be around, checking out new local bands and, and having that sense of community where you're into something a bit different. Um, but yeah, the whole thing spoke to me and, it, and it's never really left in that sense. Like I still love all those bands now and uh, and yeah, it paved the way for where I'm at now. And as much as I, I focused a, a little bit there on just like how, how incredible all these artists looked, make no mistake, they backed it up with absolute killer tunes as well. Like yeah. it weren't yeah, just like something to visualise, you know, it was like, it was an absolute fucking sonic attack, you know, it was, <laughs> yeah. uh, it was awesome. Um, well, I mean, how was school? Did you, did, did, you know, did you enjoy it? Um, I was, you know, quite sort of immature at school, if you like. Like, <laughs> a lot of kids that were more developed than me in my year, if you like. So I was quite young. But um, I was really pretty good at football. So that kind of, I think a lot of that got me through it, you know. Like, I played for the team. I played right wing. I was pretty quick. Um, I could get the ball into the box, if you like. So, like, that, that sort of made me have friends that were probably a bit cooler than me at school. Can get you um, out of trouble football, can't it? <laughs> yeah, if you're good at football, it gains, especially being young, it gains you like respect that you probably would find hard to get like just normally, yeah. for me anyway. Um, so like, yeah, I played for the school football team and I was, I was well into my sports, um, kind of struggled academically, do you know what I mean? Like didn't, wasn't really interested. I'd be, you know, I'd be, in the classroom thinking about playing football or a couple of years later than that, just thinking about getting out and going skateboarding, you know? And like, that, that was it for me. Like, I just wanted to play sports and, and get, out, get, home, get home from school and, and uh, go skateboarding or, or whatever. So yeah, that was it really. Um, yeah, I mean, school, school was all right. Apart from getting slapped about a little bit for like in like the, the more rock bands. Yeah. I don't know if this is quite interesting, like, if you talk to different people, like if I talk to the rest of uh, While She Sleeps, they got called um, like moshers at school or grebos. But yeah. where I came from, it was we were just called sweaties. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've never heard that. That's what we were, just sweaties. So like uh, last few years at school, I was a bit of a sweaty and definitely took a bit of a kick in for listening to like stuff that people didn't agree with kind of thing. Um, I don't know if that's a thing anymore. You know, like the genre clashes are that, sort of that sort of big now it's all about clashing together genres and I guess you know bands like Enter Shikari were the first band that I went to, to see actually in my local sort of scene that was like really sort of mixing that like dance or synthy trance stuff with like screaming music 
Um, but I don't know if, if that's as much of a thing now. You've got like a lot of trap artists coming out and they, you know, they almost have this like grunge, like Manson sort of edge about how they're going about their trap music. And I think, I think people nowadays are a lot more open to, to, to sort of genre clashes. And obviously the internet being the internet, like people are hearing much stuff much more wider. So I think it's a bit more open to, oh, you can listen to whatever you like and get on with it. But when I was at school, it was like, you definitely got slapped about for listening to like grunge and punk and, and, uh, and the sort of new metal stuff. So yeah, I think that's sort of changed a little bit now. I, I, I totally agree. And I do, you know, hold the internet responsible for that. I, I do think that, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you said, you know, when you discovered Linkin Park and, and, and you know, and, and bands like that, yeah. you grabbed whatever you could, but you didn't have unlimited music because, no. you know, you, you could only get what you could get, you know, burning your mate, you know, your mates a copy of a CD or a tape or whatever. Like, and so now, you know, I think that because you, you was restricted to like, you know, what you could afford and, and what you could get your hands on, you cherished it and then kind of just was on board with that 100%. Whereas now I think there's so much stuff being presented to you. And it's obviously really important to kind of open yourself up to other genres of music and, and, and to develop your, you know, your listening. Yeah. But just, and, and I do think that that is what has kind of ended that tribalism. And yeah, and it's really weird because I've spoke about this quite a lot on this podcast with you know, especially with people saying when I was at school I was this, and yeah. you know I've never yeah. had anyone say I'm sweaty. I'm I'm loving that. <laughs> yeah, I was but, sweating. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the only tribalism that I see, I mean, I, I run a, a a rock club and have done for nearly thirty years, and that's my dream job, I think. And I, <laughs> <laughs> the band, if it wasn't, it wasn't in the band, I'd like to own my own rock club, definitely. Mate, do you know why that happened? Because that fella said, they ain't going to like your band, they're going to like Marilyn Manson. So I knocked my band on the head and started that. <laughs> 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 but, um, yeah, so the, uh, yeah, where was going with it? Like, when I see the people that come through the doors now, whereas, like, historically, like, when I first started going there, there'd be guys with Chris, and I was like, oh, they're into the Smiths. Like, and then it'd be got kind of goth guys over there that were clearly like into like the cure and Rob Smith's his mercy, stuff like that. And like, and then there was like what we called Grebos were like kids with like dreads and shorts and kind of like that kind of alternative sort of early 90s skater sheet. Yeah. And so there was all of these amazing little tribes within the alternative world, if you want to call it that. Yeah. And now, when I see what comes through the door now, it's far more you could probably go into any club and no one would necessarily be able to go, oh, they like that music. Yeah, it's like the colours. Almost like the style, the style yeah. as well have all merged into yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, apart from metalers, apart like, from yeah. me metalers still wear their colours, and and yeah. you know, and 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 I think that's really important, and that's credit to that scene that people still have that passion, you know, for that that you know coat of arms, whatever you want to call it, that that kind of outfit, that dress, that mindset, you know, and yeah. I do think that that metal has definitely. Again, though, without sort of going on off tangent on that, within the realms of metal, there's a gazillion different subgenres oh, and things yeah. that have all got their own kind of look as well, you know. But yeah, definitely, yeah. <clears throat> okay, first song you bought from a record store, please, Lars. I got two cassettes at the same time, and this okay. was, um, so yeah, it was when it was amongst this time as well. And obviously, when you're a youngster, you don't necessarily just have disposable cash, so I imagine that. I think I, um, I had a paper round um, and so sort of that's what funded me going to pick up new music. So I heard um, Bum Funk MC's Freestyler um, and I heard that at pretty much the same time. I don't know if it was TV, I must have told my grandparents we didn't ask Sky at the time. Um, so I heard uh, Bum Funk MC Freestyler and Take a Look Around by Link Biscuit and it had the video with the diner and stuff. And I was hooked straight away. And I think I had this paper round at the time. And I was like, right, when I get this money, like when I get this 10 quid from like doing this paper round or whatever, seven pound, I think it was, I'm going to, I'm going to go down to tracks, which was my, um, my local sort of shop. And I bought two cassettes at uh, that time I had a yeah tape player and uh, they were the two, they were the two cassette tapes that I bought first. Yeah. I mean, solid choices. <laughs> yeah, good tunes. Yeah. No, normally, this is the question where people come up with some right howlers, but like, I mean, they're, 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 they both hold up, right? 
Yeah, yeah, they, I, yeah. Still listen to them now, and they're, they're still good tracks. So yeah, definitely. And that was the thing. I remember just going around to my mate's house and taking like or or whatever. He, he probably had a cassette player and just banging them in and just sort of like bouncing around the bedroom or whatever, you know, and just being like, yeah, these tunes are wicked. But yeah, really having that sense of like, it was the first music I'd actually bought with my own yeah. cash. Um, yeah, and went out and got those tracks. So yeah, it was cool. I think at that time as well, they all have B sides on them as well, because obviously the tape yeah. was longer than just the single. So there must have been some other stuff on there as well. Um, I don't know if Take a Look Around was like an instrumental or something of it, or, or there was another track on there. I don't remember, but yeah, they were the two first cassettes I ever bought. Yeah, nice. Um, I just want to sort of touch on uh, something in regards to uh, you know you kind of feeling like you, you know you. you you kind of dodged a few bullets from being able to sort of, you know, kick a ball at school. Uh, and yeah. then obviously, you know, when you start kind of finding your tribe and you start, you know, wearing the clothes that you want to wear and, and yeah, you know, you can sometimes find, you know, as you said, like you can get you in a bit of trouble with people that don't, you know, understand why you're doing that. Um, <laughs> I just wonder, like, would you say that, like, you was a, a confident lad? Um... In some ways, yes, and in other ways, no. I think that um, being quite immature for my age and, and being brought up by my mum mostly than my dad made me really like quite in touch with my emotional side, if you like, living with, like, growing up primarily around my mum. You know, I wasn't really sort of scared to show that, and I think that's what shaped the whole thing for me, being quite, like, not like like wearing my heart on my sleeve but also like showing other people who I was like it kind of my parents like both always um let me kind of like not do what I want to do but express myself in that way there was never really like oh like I prefer it if you didn't sort of paint your nails black or I prefer it if you didn't have like ridiculously backcombed huge emo hair do you know what I mean like and so I think them them letting me express myself in that way and like being being brought up primarily by my mom just really gave me that sense of like being able to be who I was so when I when I found this sort of rock emo punk rock scene like I was fine with just just wearing that as I wore it do you know what I mean and, and, it, and it almost like this whole feeling of like other people not liking it and maybe getting a slap it in, you know, on a, on a street that I didn't really know, like almost solidified the fact that I was different to these people. I didn't judge people by, you know, the same, the same ways other people did. And it kind of at that time made me want to wear this sort of this get up and, and wear my scene and my tribe, as you say, and, and, and the bands that I liked it, it it made me want to do that even more when I got a kick in for liking like heavy, heavy music. And I think that all that sort of stuff's character building, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. And it absolutely. just made me be like, fuck it. Like it, it kind of like, it didn't want to make me get beaten up, but it made me be like, if that's, if that's your mindset, just because I listen to stuff that's different, especially being at like 14, 15, you, you're just like, I was just like, yeah, like this it solidifies it even more for me that I'm different to the rest of these people. And, I, and I, it made me want to wear it on my sleeve even more. And believe me, at times I looked ridiculous. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, I think, I think around my local sort of rock scene, and when I, I like I started going out drinking at 17, um, I was like the first emo kid that I knew. So, when that whole like when placebo were massive and, 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 you know, like uh, bands like Funeral for a Friend were getting huge in the UK. And then you sort of start hearing about, you know, like uh, Kerrang and stuff like that. We're playing like even more like emo, like bangers from like overseas. It just getting into it a little bit and then fueling that whole thing mixed with people not really understanding where it had come from. And then like you're just seeing people style on like on telly and, and just like I was just like leaving school from from being like 14 at school to leaving school and, and and like in like early 2000s like I was just so into the scene I was just like this is me like and I don't give a fuck who knows it you know well that scene generally uh overspills when you start drinking into nightclubs so for track five <laughs> I'm going to ask you for the song that soundtrack your years uh clubbing well th this this is a weird track for me because a lot of my friends at the time I basically when I started going out to town, I was only friends with, like, my school was a couple of bus rides away. So, naturally, I didn't really have any friends that lived 
close to me in my neighborhood, if you like, or around my streets. So when I started going out, um, the, the lads that I was in like a punk rock band playing out on my grandparents' garage with, they weren't old enough to go out and start drinking. So, and, and I was like almost 18 and started just like walking into the town centre myself on my own. So I met a lot of people along the way that like weren't really into the emo thing. They were a couple of years older than me. So they kind of skipped the emo scene. So I was like an emo kid hanging, hanging out with like, just whoever would chat to me in the local rock bar really. And just being like, yeah, like it didn't really bother me to like, walk into town and, and sort of go out on my own. I just go out on my own and like grab a pint, you know what I mean? And then like, it was one of them things that like, after a while, obviously you, you, hook, you hook up with people, you, you meet new friends and then that was that. But initially I just used to rock up, rock up to like rock bars on my own and just start talking to people about like music styles or like, you know, just, just general stuff. Um, and they were all into like heavily into like Lamb of God. So, but I'm like, I remember saying to one of these guys at the time, like, I don't think I'll ever be into Lamb of God. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I actually, like, I hate the fact that I ever said that now because Lamb of God are, like, one of my favourite bands ever. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, at the time, I was, like, just really emo and, and, like, quite naive to, like, a lot of stuff and being, like, I'll never not be an emo kid. Like, I was so into it that I was just, like, I'll never not be an emo kid. This is, like, this is what, this is me. So, yeah, but then you know, a couple of years down the line, like Lamb of God turned into my favorite band and it was always Redneck that they play. Even when I was like younger and all these old, more older like metal dudes are like head banging to Lamb of God. Because back then as well, you weren't going to gigs like constantly. So like the rock night was almost like a gig as well. Yeah. So you would, you would like literally get on the dance floor and like mosh. Like I remember going out to like nightclubs like every Tuesday night and it, you would like literally have a mosh pit on the dance floor like I can't really I mean that stuff definitely still does happen but like back then it was just like it was like a full-blown like slipknot gig at, at, like in your local rock club you know what I mean it was it was gnarly uh, our people just weren't completely messed up the whole time with like broken bones and stuff it, <laughs> beyond me but yeah like so it, it was redneck for me and that's that's like stuck with me now when I hear that song I'm like that just it takes me back to such an era where I was like going out to rock bars and like just 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 exploring different sounds and different styles of music and just going out wild and just like drinking as much as I possibly could for like like some some of the like nightclubs back then I'd like it was like five quid in all you can drink and stuff yeah. you know like it was just mental like I just yeah can't imagine that now but yeah um that, that was the earliest memory and, and one of the songs that's really stuck with me from those times and so again you've I just want to pick up on the confidence thing again because you said that you'd go into clubs, uh, or, or you know, and bars on your own and just yeah. chat to people. I mean, that's that's impressive, man. Like, I, I've I've not got that in me, but um, <laughs> but then obviously, you know, you've you've walked out on stage and and just took the roof off of you know gigs and festivals in front of thousands <laughs> of people over the years. So, <laughs> how, how do you, you know, have you got? Do you feel confident doing that now? Yeah, yeah. People always kind of say to me, you know, do you, do you get nervous before you go on? And, and, you know, we end up playing shows that often that it turns from being less of a nervousness and you've got, because you've got confidence by, by now, like we've been doing this a long time now. So we've got confidence in our live performance. You know, I know I can go up there and sort of hold my own in terms of vocals and entertaining people. So for me, it's turned from, it's turned from being like a nervousness to, to get on stage to, um, to just an exciting buzz about getting out there and like in, enjoying the show and being in the thick of it with everyone else. Um, one thing that like is important for me with this whole transition of like being a youngster into, um, into sort of like trying to find confidence to be in a band and stuff. Like from, from day one, my grandparents let me like form a band in their garage. And like with all this going on with my parents breaking up and like getting kicked in every now and again for like in rock music and stuff like that, like, it was, it was huge for me to have that space to like, as an outlet to let go of like negative energy and just like get in there and like slam some drums around or, or, or scream. And I never like, I never had the patience to learn guitar or anything like that. So I basically passed like my younger brother a guitar and he would like, he was so young at the time. Like I was 16, like he was like 12 or something. Um, and I was like going, oh yeah, you can play this, bro. So I was encouraging him to play it, but then I would just get the mic and I would just be screaming my head off and like, just letting out that emotion. And, and for me, like 
that turned into what it is now for me. It's still the same. Like I, I use the stage show as like a workout for myself and having lockdown one and two has really taught me how much I do or have over the past needed live shows. So now I'm like, I'm, I'm going out on runs every other day because it, that, it, that helps me like shake that like heavy low that I sometimes feel. Yeah. Um, and and it, I've never really realized until I've had time off of touring and, and like I've tried to cut back on the drink and, and all that stuff. So getting out and, and getting the exercise in is, is so important for my mental health these days. I can't stress that enough to anyone that's like, might be going through like some difficult times and like, it's, it's crazy how much that exercise and getting your body sweating and moving it like how much it, it helps with uh, with just your brain and, and, and your outcome. So um, that's something I've been doing. But yeah, it was always about that for me, having that space and that that place to to express myself. And then, yeah, so that's just evolved. And like for all of us in our band now, like we're an energetic band because it's almost like that's what we need. It lets us let go of frustrations. And like when when you come off a stage, it's like, it's that release and you feel like a stone lighter, you know, you're just like, Oh, like I needed that. So yeah, yeah. It's, that sort of thing's always been important to me. Cool. Well, I'm going to take you home now for track six and uh, it's a favorite song from an artist from your home County, please. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this song I'll choose uh, is by a band called color of fire. So they weren't like, they, they weren't like directly right where I'm from, but a friend showed me this band um, years ago and it's got ever so similar vibes to the Refuse New Noise, where it's got like long intros, but it's also, I can't, I can't explain it, it's like got a bit of a radio head kind of vibe, I guess. Um, but the track's amazing. So the band is The Colour of Fire, and the track's called The Company Won't Colour Me. Um, yeah, and it's just an unbelievable track. I don't like know crazy amounts about the band, I'm pretty sure they're not going anymore. Um, but that song, like, if anyone can give it some time and give it a listen, I think you'll agree. It's like, it's a really special song. Great. It's, it's absolutely cracking. And I heard it, like, for the first time when you sent your, your, your list over. I've never heard of them. Yeah. Uh, and, and I went on and I put it on. And it's definitely got a kind of, um, yeah, it's, I'd say it's probably more sort of alternative rock than than, than kind of, yeah, I would say that's the genre if I had to pigeonhole it. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And it's got elements of, like, a little bit of kind of sort of lo-fi sort of skater rock to it as well it's really good really really good um it's like really driving mm. like it, it like chugs through it but yeah. It, but yeah his voice is quite delicate at times and he uses his voice really well so yeah it's, it's a good track well for your last track uh you get to play dj on this one Loz, and uh it's a song <laughs> that many may not know that yeah. you'd like them to hear yeah well I've, I've been into this band for a few years now um they're like, they're coming out of America. I don't, I don't exactly know where, but for anyone that's like sort of into sort of every time I die, I guess, and a bit of Dillinger, they sort of, Dillinger Escape Plan, they sort of cross over that a little bit with having their own thing as well. Um, the band's called Grey Haven. Um, the song's called Blemish. For anyone who's into that sort of that sort of thing, check them out. They're a, they're a great band. Um, and yeah, this is a ridiculously good song. I love it. Well, people can do that. Um, they can head over to Spotify and uh, listen to every single uh, track that you've picked today, Loz. Yeah. Um, as we, uh, I mean, we're recording this at the beginning of, of, of March uh, 2021. So as, you know, in the light of what the government said and, and vaccinations rolling out and, you know, starting to see festivals being announced this year, which is something I didn't think we was going to see. Um, yeah. What are you excited about personally? And what's coming up professionally? Um, personally, I'm in the process of buying a new house. Um, so that's definitely a positive for me coming out of this time. Like, I'm really stoked. It's like, it's like on the edge of being done, a done deal. So like myself and my partner, we're so stoked. And like, if it comes through, then absolutely amazing. We'll be over the moon. Um, I'm really stoked for people to hear um, our new record, the Sleep Society um, record. Um, I think that if you are open-minded in terms of genre clashes um, and if you you know you like alternative music but you're still open to you know like as a band while she sleeps likes sort of light stuff we love heavy stuff sometimes a bit of pop sometimes a bit of like really really heavy stuff so I, I personally feel like if you're open-minded in terms of genres and, and genre clashing then there's something in our record for everybody um, 
So I would just say, yeah, if you've got the time, check it out. We're super excited for people to hear it. And like I mentioned, a song with um, uh, Simon Neal from Biffy Claro guesting on it called Nervous. That to me feels like it's going to be a huge song for people and sort of the feeling of our nation right now. And I hope, I hope it's taken in that way and I hope, it, uh, I hope it's received really well and people kind of find some hope in, in what we're trying to say with that song. Um, that's exactly what it does for me. Um, so yeah, that, that, they're two things I'm really excited about. Um, I love summer. So the fact that, you know, lockdown in winter, I feel like is a lot more difficult than lockdown in the summer. Oh, so you know, much just, so. just being able to sit out and, and enjoy a bit of sunshine. And, and like, yeah, I love the sun. So it's, you know, the fact that it's getting a bit warmer now, we're seeing a bit of a change. And like, I think, like I said before, like, it's tough. I think it gets tough on everyone's mind when you start thinking about the long game of this. And like, I feel like it's very important for people not to get too hung up on when things are going to get back to normal, because if it doesn't, then it's only going to hit you even harder that we, that as a country, we haven't got back to, to some sort of normality when we're promised it by our government. So I think like try and focus on the small victories and uh, keep your mental health. Like keep, firstly, look after number one uh, and try and figure out, what that is, is going to work for you best, whether that's what some things we've spoken about, exercise and getting them headphones on and playing your favourite songs and going for a bit of a run or a workout. Because I, like I said, I can't stress this last year and the year before, I never really knew how important it was for me personally. And, and, it, and it literally just changes my outlook and changes my perceptions on, on everything really. So PMA initially and everyone stay safe, like talk to each other because... Uh, because it does get tough and people need to open up and, uh, and voice out the feeling without any sort of worry about any prejudice or anything like that, whether you're a big, <laughs> big blur, burly bloke, you know what I mean? You're allowed to tell people um, how you feel and, uh, and that goes, you know, that goes vice versa for other people. Open up to people, let them know you're there. And don't, like, I don't know, don't just say you're there and then not follow it up, you know, just a quick text to be like, dude, I know I've said this before, but I am here if you want to chat. Like, I think it's crucially important that we come together so that when this stuff does open, you're like, all your friends are there, you know, and then uh, they're not in any weird situations that you could have avoided if you just sort of opened up a bit. So, yeah, th that's kind of some of the things that I think is important to mention and, um, and yeah, what I'm excited about. Lars, I don't think I can add anything to that. What a perfect way to end the chat. Man, that, that, was, that was beautiful. Um, man, I've had an absolute joy talking to you today. Likewise, uh, man, likewise. When all this lifts up, we'll have to grab a beer somewhere at a gig or something. And, absolutely, uh, chat mate. More. Absolutely. Come to my club, mate. And, uh, yeah. and for people that want to um, find out about the band, if they're not aware of you already, where's the best place to find out about uh, the um, band and what's happening? We're on everything. So wherever you want to go, we're, we're pretty much there. But the... The best place is uh, whilesheesleeps.com and there's just links there to everything. So yeah, if, if you've heard of the band and you're out there supporting, then thank you so much. And if you haven't, you know, check it out. Like I say, I think there's something within While She Sleeps that, uh, that everyone can get into. So yeah. Wonderful. Well, we'll tag you in everything when this goes out. And then for those that uh, are yet to discover your band, uh, they've just got to click the link and they're straight through. And uh, and yeah, and I, I recommend you do so. Lars, thanks so much, man. No worries at all, man. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Cheers, buddy. Safe. Right. I'm going to press stop there.